Hello and welcome to Prairie Pulse. Coming up a little bit later in the show, we'll meet Bismarck Impressionist painter uh, Donna Christie. But first, joining me now is the president of the Capitol Gallery in Bismarck and new gallery in Medora we're going to talk about a little bit later, David Borlaug. David, Hi. thanks for joining us today. Glad to be here as always. As we get started, tell the folks a little bit about yourself and your background in North Dakota. Well, grew up in a, in a newspaper publishing family, became corporate, uh, then started, launched a nonprofit foundation, the Lewis and Clark Foundation, which for nearly 20 mm -hmm. years operated the Lewis and Clark Center in Fort Mandan at Washburn. And four years ago, we made a dramatic change in that the Lewis and Clark Center in Fort Mandan became a state park, part of the state park system. And it was always owned by the state of North Dakota, but it was a unique public-private partnership. And we made a determination uh, to do that, to perpetuate what we had created back in the 90s. And so now it's part of the state park system, and our foundation continues as a nonprofit. And we went looking for a new mission, and it's simply celebrating history, art, and culture. And under that mission statement, we opened the Capitol Gallery in downtown Bismarck three years ago. All right, well, there you go. I was going to say, tell us a little bit about that one before we move to Medora. Yeah. Yeah, we opened the gallery in November of uh, three years ago, uh, 2016, I guess, and just really off to the races. It's a fine art retail gallery. It augments our fundraising by selling fine art, but it also fulfills our mission. We're really, we're an art museum as well as a gallery, a retail gallery. Um, you know, 99 percent of the people that walk through our doors don't walk out with a painting, but they really, really enjoy fine art. And we reveal artists from across the region and beyond to an ever-growing audience, and uh, it's, it's just really been a wonderful way to achieve that mission. And with that said, uh, now you've just opened recently the Capitol Gallery West in Medora. Tell us about that and how you got it going. We were asked by our friends Randy Hudson-Beeler and others at the, the Theodore Roosevelt Medora Foundation to come in and partner with them. They have a wonderful outlook as a nonprofit in their own right. They call it partnering with champions. And when they want to achieve a certain goal, and they look around and they see someone else maybe better equipped to do it, they say, let's bring them in. And they had struggled with the fine art component of all the myriad of wonderful things you can experience in Medora. And so we opened the Capitol Gallery West, a retail gallery again, in the Harold Schaefer Heritage Center. And then in the nearby Von Hoffman Historic House, we brought in visiting artists all summer long, nearly 20 artists who came and free and open to the public demonstrated, visited with people from across North Dakota, around the world, literally. So really, really struck to the heart of our mission of revealing fine art and culture to the world. It was a wonderful experience. And, well, and you talked about Monroe Foundation. I mean, uh, you know, how much support have you gotten from them? Is it financial support, in-kind mm -hmm. support? What have you gotten? It's a combination of everything. They made the space available to us, first and foremost, and mm -hmm. then treated us, our people were like employees. And that worked out really well. And then because we're a nonprofit, we reach out and Starian Bank was our underwriting sponsor. And another uh, family foundation chose to also help us out in an anonymous way. So generous people and businesses, that's always been the hallmark of how we make good things happen. And it all came together very, very nicely in Medora. And uh, it was just a great experience. I spent much of the summer out there myself, just wanting to really get a feel for how this was going to work. And my board of directors agreed that come summer, things can get a little quiet downtown, Bismarck, Fargo, anywhere. And if you really want to reach out and, and engage with people all summer long, go where the people are. Mm -hmm. And in North Dakota, that's Medora and the Badlands. So with that said, only been open a few months thus far. What's sort of been the response to that second gallery? It's been a terrific response. Uh, I just uh, went back recently. We. We shut down more or less the active uh, part of it with uh, now that it's in off-season mode in Medora. But I still have art out there, and I go back and forth and uh, show people. And we, we consummated a really, really nice sale mm -hmm. last week. So um, it really, really went over well. But first and foremost, we just exposed so many people to fine art. But also, we had some nice sales. Well, with that said, uh, well, are there any differences between the two galleries when you arrive or walk in? Uh, scale, size, a little bit smaller in Medora, but the same artists, by and large. We just put a little heavier emphasis on Western Americana 
that's obviously what people are going to expect when they're in the Badlands. And uh, we just really hit the mark with uh, most of the people, I think, that walked through the gallery, it was their first experience in an art gallery. And when they see paintings, well, maybe some are hundreds of dollars, but some are several thousands of dollars. And that was kind of revealing to a lot of people. It was fun to watch. Mm -hmm. Well, you mentioned this a little bit, but let's go back a little bit to when you first decided to open the main gallery in Bismarck. Sort of a career change, or mm -hmm. maybe you even said off, off camera here, sort of reinventing yourself in a way, and what you did. Talk about that and, and what the transition was like. It wasn't a dramatic transition as some people think. Running this interpretive center at Washburn all those years, we early on made a decision to use art as interpretation. And part of what is now uh, part of, uh, owned by the people of North Dakota, is a million dollar art collection. The historical art of Carl Bodmer, George Catlin from the 1840s, and then contemporary artists like Michael Haynes, Walter Peel, and others that we built over time through the support of generous donors. Now that's all part of the state of North Dakota. And so for them to shift gears, and our foundation was very generous with me saying, David, where do you want to go? What are, what are we going to do now? And art was just a logical, easy decision to make. And, and now I'm having the time of my life. But now, of course, you're a nonprofit. Mm -hmm. But so as a nonprofit, is there more uh, sort of going on to, than just exhibiting the art to the public? Well, absolutely. Uh, exhibiting the art is key. And as I said, it's not all about the sale. It's also about showing the art. That fulfills our philanthropic mission. But we're also doing more in, in art outreach. Uh, we're, we're collaborating with others in the communities, uh, bringing in, for example, uh, a school program, Peer to Peer it's called, at Century High School, mm -hmm. where students in a leadership program are paired up with students that are perhaps more challenged. Maybe they're, they're recent immigrants. Maybe they're in the special needs program. It's a wonderful, wonderful program, and they create a joint exhibit that we then showcase in our gallery. That's just one example of how we reach out and make our space available to others. We've had uh, the National Leukemia Lymphoma Association, the Nature Conservancy, Invisible Innocence, a nonprofit dedicated to battling human trafficking. We collaborate with all these other nonprofits or public-minded organizations to let the attraction of a beautiful art gallery bring people in and yet expose them to something in the social area or in a community need. Yeah, you mentioned some of the artists just a moment ago, but uh, can you talk more about those artists and really how do you find artists, new artists yeah. to bring in and, and what's your goal when, you, when you're when you looking at well, an artist? Well, trust me, now that we've been successful, <laughs> the artists are all coming to us. Yeah, yeah. But uh, they're, they're local, they're regional, they're, they're near and far. Right now, through the end of December, we're showcasing Bismarck artist, Jessica Wachter, who spent a lot of time in Fargo as well, NDSU graduate. And she's collaborated in a really fascinating way with a Bismarck native, Kent Burkhardsmeyer, who is a photographer. He's had studios, uh, galleries in Florida to London, England. And they're collaborating on an exhibit called Connected. So imagine photography on canvas painted through or vice versa. It's going to be really, really amazing. And that is in our space through the end of the year. Now, when you have an artist come in, I mean, how long do you keep their art or is it there? And Permanently? or no. Well, we, we continue to represent a, sort of a stable of artists. Walter Peel from Minot, for mm -hmm. example. Um, we have sold dozens of his paintings. There's always going to be a few Walter Peels available to take a look mm -hmm. at. But uh, the, the main floor space, we devote two to three months at a time to changing exhibits. Mm -hmm. well, talk about what, what goes, on, goes into an opening for an artist. It's a big deal. Um, we're in the midst right now of staging the, the, the next one, and it's uh, weeks of preparation, days of on the ground preparation, the logical things like painting and patching walls and what have you. But uh, also the biggest part, the most challenging part, and it's, it's usually where I come in, get people there. Reach out to invite people and publicize and promote. I've got a wonderful staff that uh, Cody Miller and Sarah Rent Rosenquist that uh, collaborate, we're, we're three of us, and then a few part-time folks that make it all work. But we went from being a foundation with 20 plus employees to one with three full-time. Mm 
Mm -hmm. And so it's it's an all it's you wear a lot of hats and all hands on deck. Yeah, well, well, with both the galleries, maybe. What kind of hours do you have for those? Uh, we're, we're open six days a week. We, uh, unlike a lot of galleries, they're closed on Mondays. I hate that. You know, <laughs> why be closed on a Monday? But we're open six days a week, ten to five, and both in in Bismarck and in Medora. And in Medora, we expect to be reopening uh, the end of May. Yeah. All over again. Okay. Well, you talked about some of the artists. Are you surprised uh, by the amount of artists that we have in our region? There are so many. And, and what's so exciting about this and exciting about our role in that is more and more artists are able to make a living with art. Uh, typically, uh, you know, it, it's kind of like the way farming used to be. You had to have a second job. But uh, more and more, and especially young artists, we, coincidence or not, but young female artists in particular, are really making their way, are, are able to make this their craft, makes this their living, and that's exciting. We, we've shipped art of old Jessica Walker, for example. We've shipped 10-foot pieces to Palm Springs, California, to Scottsdale, Arizona, and drove a truck to Minneapolis twice. So the demand is there, and people are recognizing that wonderful fine art is coming out of North Dakota. Wow, that's interesting. So, you know, what kind of investment was it for you to open this second gallery? I mean financially? It was, uh, well, it was a $20,000 budget and largely underwritten with corporate support. And then after that, we hoped for sales to to mm -hmm. augment and what have you. And it all bore out. I mean, it, it really, really was good. But it's also, we, we work on thin budgets. We are a mm -hmm. nonprofit, you know what that's mm -hmm. like. And so we make things work. Um, I lived in a, a really, really small motel room for three months in Medora <laughs> to make it work, for example. Well, and you mentioned Medora. You mentioned a little bit about why you picked it, but because uh, you said go where the people are. Mm -hmm. And but so why Medora? Why not another city in in somewhere in North Dakota? Why Medora? Well, Medora is our it's our tourist attraction. It, it's the number one place to be all summer. If we wanted to be in the eastern part of the state, we wouldn't be in downtown Fargo. We'd be in Detroit Lakes if we really wanted to get people. But you go where the people are, and you go where those experiences can really play out. Uh, one, one quick example is one day in the gallery in Medora, I had a blind girl come in who was hoping to touch and have a tactile experience with things. And with these beautiful paintings by Kira Ferkel from Billings, Montana, mm -hmm. big, thick palette knife paintings. And one of them was called, Zip doesn't care what the other boys think. She likes her new pink bandana. Zip was a dog, a cattle dog with a pink bandana. And I took the girl's hand and ran it around the shape of the dog and asked her if she could tell who Zip is. We got about halfway around and she lit up and asked, is Zip a puppy? If you can help a blind girl see a painting, you're doing something pretty special hmm. wherever you are. Yeah, I've seen some of those paintings displayed. Uh, how do you divide your time between the two galleries now? I mean, you, mm -hmm. you, I mean, now that you're settling down with with it being open. Now that we're seasonal in Medora, mm -hmm. primarily, it's just summertime was pretty intense, and so I was in Medora most of the time. But you know, it's a two-hour trip on I-94. You meet yourself coming and going, and it it worked out just fine. There were there were days I would drive back to Bismarck, have a meeting, and drive right back again, or get up the next morning. But it worked out really well, and again, with, with a, a wonderful staff that pitched in above and beyond and made sure Bismarck was running along clickety-clack while I was in Medora most of the time. But then we all kind of took our shifts, too. Yeah. And you talked about staffing. I mean, you, I think you said three full-time. Full-time. But, you know, you said six days a week, ten to five. I mean, how many part-timers, how much staffing do you really have? Mm -hmm. We have an additional three part-timers, and we're lucky we have people that, that like to work weekends, and so that works out for us. But, uh, oh, let's just say I've maybe had one or two weekends off in the past year. <laughs> if you love what you do, every day is an adventure. It's, it's like uh, when we had the Interpretive Center. I tried to tell my staff that didn't always buy it, but when you're in this business, every day's a holiday, every day's a vacation. <laughs> It's just somebody else. Yeah. But I, I love my work, I love what I'm doing, and I don't mind putting in long hours. Okay. Well, you mentioned the Interpretive Center, and you've talked about it a little bit. So let's go back to that and tell the folks a little bit about the years you worked there mm -hmm. and, and maybe some of your proudest moments there and what all that accomplished. And still running, so how's that going? No, it, it's a wonderful legacy, I'm, mm -hmm. of which I'm very, very proud. It all started in the early 90s 
and then culminating with the opening of the Lewis and Clark Interpretive Center in 1997. It was a, a public-private partnership, a collaborative effort between the Department of Transportation, Parks and Recreation, the Historical Society, others, and our nonprofit, which we created for this purpose. And then over time, over an 18-year period, we doubled in size twice. We amassed a wonderful art collection, remade exhibits. Over an 18-year period, we raised uh, over $30 million mm. through, through operations, but primarily through the generosity of corporations and individuals. And in the process, created a world-class attraction that still people are coming from all across America and around the world to, to have revealed to them a pretty fascinating story, which is the Lewis and Clark Expedition. It's timeless, and it's, it's a good investment now for the state of North Dakota to have it ensconced within the park system. And it's a great piece of history that people still love Absolutely. learning more about. Very much so. Yeah. Well, let's turn back to your galleries. You know, you mentioned uh, the blind lady. Of mm. course, that, that, that's maybe the only story you need to say. But, you know, w what do you want people to, to feel or take away when they come to your gallery and explore? Just, you know, there are so many qualities of, of art and fine art. Uh, the, the, the nuances of determining what's fine art and what isn't. That, that's the tricky part. But there are healing powers in art. We're working with uh, the medical community about you know, the possibility for things like uh, workshops and art classes. Uh, imagine um, postpartum depression after, after a young woman has, has had a baby. And, but it's, it's mom's night out. And do that through art. Working with uh, children of all sizes and shapes and ages, but then children that are somewhere on the autism spectrum which by the way, almost all great artists are somewhere, but bring them in, imagine throwing plastic down on the gallery floor and letting them just reveal their creativity, just run amok with art. Yeah. Those are the kinds of things that we want to do, we will do, and we're looking for support to do because we are a nonprofit, we have a higher purpose, we're showing great art, we're selling fine art, that's part of our funding mechanism but we have to do something more, and we're excited about doing that. If people are interested, how do they go about buying art from you? They can, you know, obviously visit us at 109 North 4th Street in downtown Bismarck, but we have a website, thecapitalgallery.com. Uh, that's probably the quickest way to reach out, and we have a portfolio. Most of our artists, all of our artists, are represented with uh, galleries online, so at thecapitalgallery.com. We're on Facebook, Instagram, the usual social media platforms. But the best thing to do is walk into the gallery, uh, just the downtown Bismarck, and come summertime, uh, also on 4th Street in the middle of downtown Medora. Mm -hmm. Well, what are your goals down the road for the galleries? I think with the goals, it's, it's continuing to be a showcase for the remarkable artists that we do have in our communities and beyond. We're not restricted to North Dakota, Minnesota, South Dakota. But just to show people the depth of the, the quality of art that we have in our region. But also then to touch people, touch those that otherwise would never be exposed to art. But in a way, in a meaningful way, and in a way that we'd like to think that uh, we're perfectly suited to do. Yeah. Well, David, we really are out of time, but any new ventures out there? Oh, there's so much. We just, we just, you, it'll drive my board of directors and my staff crazy if we started talking. Well, so. With that said, uh, let's one more time. If people want more information about the gallery, where is the, where is the best place to go? Thecapitalgallery.com. Look for us on Facebook. Look for David Borlock on Facebook. Uh, you know, you'll, you'll find a lot there as well. But <laughs> the Capital Gallery, uh, search us. You'll find us and look for us downtown Bismarck. David, thanks so much for joining us today. Thank you. Stay tuned for more. Donna Christie is an Impressionist painter who lives in Bismarck. Originally from Texas, she came to professional painting later in life and now exhibits and sells her work. Her painting takes the viewer to a place of sanctity, a walk in the woods, and a walk on the prairie. I'm Donna Christie. I love to paint because I love the juicy 
brilliant colors. I just love to paint pictures that have that beautiful color and it seems to bring joy to people. It brings joy to me when I do it and it takes a lot of stress and burdens of the day off of me when I'm able to come in and, and just mix color and apply it to the canvas. We just got back from Scotland and my intention was to get lots of painting references that I could use for my paintings. And this was at one of the castles that we visited. We took a picture of some gardens. And this was a picture that we took there in one of the gardens of a castle there in Scotland. It's impressionist painting. It's just an impression of what I'm seeing. I start with a transparent undercoating. So I start on a museum quality white board, and then I come in with a mixture of a solvent that I get from Europe mixed with lanolin oil. And I thin down my paints and make a very thin wash and just get a basic outline of what I want to paint. After that, I come back with just plain paint and just start creating. I've always had an artistic interest, but I didn't really know how to paint. I'd never taken any painting classes, but it was always something that was interesting to me. I always thought that I would like to learn how to paint. What started me deciding to buy paints and get started was the movie The Notebook. There's a scene in there where he makes a studio for the woman he loves. I just saw that and I thought, you know, I could do that. <laughs> My family was always teasing me because it would take me like six months to do a painting. Dreama Tulperi really changed the way I painted and she's the one that taught me this technique. I was able to finish several paintings in that weekend that I was at that workshop. And then I came home and started implementing what I had learned, just started really changing the way I painted and was able to produce paintings that could put on the wall in no time. I just want the paintings to be pretty. I want something for people to look at that brings them joy. Donna Christie came to our attention and I was immediately taken by her work. Very much uh, impressionist. She seems to capture a moment out for a walk in the woods or out on the prairie. And that's what people pick up on. That's what they see when they look at her paintings. They imagine themselves on that trail, on that path. And she does it very, very delightfully. And she's gone over really well. The first night we sold six paintings. So that was exciting for me to see that people liked my art and were interested in it. Kim from North Dakota Council on the Arts was at my opening and said that she was interested in me exhibiting at the Capitol. And so that right now, my pieces are at the Capitol. It is overwhelming to me and very humbling to me that people do enjoy my paintings. I feel very honored that people want me to put my paintings in their gallery. And then when people actually enjoy looking at it, it is an unbelievable joy that I can't even explain. We're seeing more and more artists like her that have been painting for a long time, but never really thought about becoming commercial, if you will, or exhibiting certainly in a gallery. And we really encourage that. The opening reception, probably one of the better sales events that we had at a reception. North Dakotans in particular tend to be a little more reserved and they don't like to show off in front of other people and make a purchase. But in this case, a lot of people did and we were very happy and she certainly was as well. I hope to add more paintings back at Capitol Gallery. David and I have talked about that. The peace and the calm that comes over me. I turn on my music and I have my diffuser on with great essential oils and it just takes me away into a more peaceful place and as I've gotten older 
that has become very important to me to have that peace of mind, that joy, and those colors on that canvas and being able to put them down with a brush or a palette knife and to create something that's beautiful to me and I hope beautiful to the people that look at it is a very calming thing that I really need in my life. Well, that's all we have on Prairie Pulse this week. And as always, thanks for watching. by the North Dakota Council on the Arts and by the members of Prairie Public.